everybody. So happy to be here today with all of you. Indeed we are. Good evening. <laughs> that was not a rhetorical salutation. That was, that was an honest, heartfelt greeting. Couldn't you feel that? Let me try it again. Take two. Good evening, everyone. Ah, and a heartfelt response. You know, it's really important for me as a philosopher to get the heartfelt response because I'm not entirely sure that I exist and, <laughs> and I'm not sure that you exist. And so when I hear back something from you, that is highly reassuring to me. What a just an honor and a delight to be able to gather together with you this evening to talk about some really important topics that are important for everyone in all of our lives. We're very grateful to Vanessa for that uh, lovely introduction and for your partnership uh, over the years and to Mark Williamson for his great support, um, to all the volunteers who've helped make this evening possible. Um, I love just the name Action for Happiness and all the work that is being done under that name. Uh, it's really terrific to see the focus being on the action. And so you'll see that uh, reflected in what we'll talk about uh, this evening as well. Uh, Sir Anthony Selden, Lord Richard Layard, uh, our tremendous colleagues, friends who've been working in this field for, uh, for a long uh, time with us. So it's a real delight um, to be here. It's great to see some of our MAP graduates as well in the, in the audience. So uh, welcome uh, to you. And my goodness, thank you for coming. It would be very awkward to have this meeting without you. I know that there's a lot going on in each one of your lives, uh, and so for you to make the choice to be with us to talk about these very important matters, um, we really take that quite seriously, and we're grateful for that, so thank you. We're excited to talk um, this evening uh, about uh, being happy together and how positive psychology can help us improve our relationships. Are you familiar with positive psychology? Okay, so many of you are, some of you um, not as much perhaps, but basically the field of positive psychology is about 20 years old or so, and the field was founded by leading psychologists who noted that psychology tended to focus on what is wrong with people and how to fix it, which of course is very important, uh, but seemed to be neglecting the other side, the complementary side of focusing on what goes well with people and how to cultivate it which is just as important and honestly a whole lot more fun. So we want to talk about some of the basic ideas and research in positive psychology as connected to relationships this evening. So when I first started studying positive psychology more than 10 years ago, I was really fascinated by the research. I was also wondering why there wasn't focus on relationships. So a lot of the research I studied, I heard about individual well-being, we know that's, of course, incredibly important. We also know, though, that as social animals, we exist in relationship with others. So unless you're a happy hermit, my husband jokes as a philosopher, you know, there are some happy hermits. I don't know about that. But um, improving our relationships with others, whether it's our friends, our family, our significant others, um, that's really, really important. Chris Peterson, one of the founding fathers of positive psychology, summed up the uh, field in three words. He said, other people matter. Because when looking at research they found um, in interviewing people, if you could name you know, at least one person, hopefully you know, two or three, that no matter what, in the middle of the night, at 3 a.m., that you could call in a crisis, then that voted pretty well for your well-being. Um, Sadly, though, you know, some people can't or, you know, it, relationships can be challenging. So how can we work on relationships better? And while James and I wrote a book on romantic relationships, the concepts we're going to talk about today are important for any kind of relationship. So like I said, it could be your friends or colleagues at work. It doesn't just have to be with your significant other. So with that said, many of the examples that we use will be focusing on romantic relationships. Uh, and we want to begin by saying that we have, again, tremendous respect for each one of you and whatever your personal experience or life history with romantic relationships. Some of you may be in a great relationship and want to continue to make that even better. Others of you may be in relationships, you know, romantic relationships that don't feel romantic anymore and you're wondering how to get that spark back. Some of you may feel like, you know, romantic relationships probably just aren't for me because every time I get in them, it seems like they blow up and then things get messy and I wonder why I even try. 
Others of you may be in relationships like my parents who have just celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. Um, wow, that's an amazing accomplishment, um, just to be alive that long, uh, but then to be alive together that long. Um, and they're very cute. You should see them. They still, they walk around holding hands and caring for each other, and it's really, really lovely. And if you would have asked us, or if you would have asked me, you know, 10 years ago if I was going to write a book, Definitely not, and definitely not on relationships, romantic ones. So what do I do? I write a book on relationships with my husband. This wasn't planned. As Vanessa mentioned, um, I happened to write an article for Scientific American Mind, and I felt more that I needed to write this book than I wanted to, to be honest. I was curious why the relationship research um, kind of sat in dusty books and wasn't really out there, and stuff you did read about in the press, often it was just kind of, you know, dumbed down, simplified, and three easy steps to this, or top 10 you know, ways to do this without um, maintaining integrity to the science. So what we really look to do to bring this research um, into you know, the public in an accessible way. Um, I also found that it was, I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but you know, growing up, um, I always learned if you wanted to stay fit, you, know, you go to the gym, you work out, it's healthy habits. At work, if you want to uh, climb the uh, you know career ladder, you don't just get a job and sit around. No, you take you know training classes, you find a mentor. But I never really learned growing up it, with relationships kind of similar. You have to work on it. And if you look to pop culture, like many of us do, I mean, I'm guilty of you know working in the media a long time, so maybe it was a little jaded. But I just kind of thought like what the fairy tale book said. You know, you meet your prince charming, you fall in love, you get married, and that's it. And I think a lot in our movies and um, in culture today, uh, it's often portrayed that way. And I think it does a real disservice. I think if we looked at relationships the way we looked at other areas of our life and realizing it takes work, um, it would probably help most people. Yeah, so relationships and romantic relationships come in all different sorts. Um, and uh, our point here isn't to tell anybody what kind of or who they should choose to love, what we're trying to do is to think about how we can all love well or love better in whatever relationship uh, we find ourselves in. Now, across the pond, a few months ago, we were all riveted by a particular relationship that was celebrated in a unique way here in this country. <laughs> and of course, it was a very beautiful a wedding, and I feel that it brought a lot of uh, communities together, which is a great thing. And um, they seem like a lovely couple. Um, but even royals have to work on their marriage or relationship, like we regular people here. I think that, unfortunately, in pop culture, like I said, uh, that message kind of gets lost by, at least in, uh, when it comes to movies, the way romances are portrayed. So it's easy to romanticize things and to imagine that it must be easy if you're a real prince and princess. Um, to help us kind of dig into this question a little bit more, we um, invited a couple of people from the United States to help us make this point. The so worlds were can... too busy. They couldn't come. So yeah, we had exactly. to bring some Americans. <laughs> so see if you can recognize uh, these folks. You complete me. I want just has shut up. Just shut up. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. <laughs> so who was this? Jerry Maguire, exactly, Jerry Maguire. You complete me. Now, um, that's an interesting uh, take on relationships. It's been around uh, for a very long time, at least since the days of Plato, when in his dialogue on the symposium he wrote uh, uh, about, he had Aristophanes, the playwright, put in an interesting myth about our other halves and seeking for uh, our other halves. And this notion of soulmate has been one that has been pervasive in our culture. And if by soulmate we mean 
having a deep relationship. We have nothing, of course, against the term soulmate. But sometimes the notion of a soulmate can take on kind of mythic and mystical proportions of a kind of fated relationship that either will happen or it will not. And a problem with that notion of soulmates is that it seems there's really nothing we can do to prepare ourselves for it, to help it to happen, to um, cultivate it when it does happen. It's just kind of the cosmos is making this happen. In contrast, we think that relationships are things that it's important to prepare for and to work with and to work on. Another thing that this kind of soulmate, this mythical notion of soulmate can do is it can lead to a kind of dependence in relationships. Uh, I like to think of it as a kind of a lean-to relationship where you're leaning on each other, which might seem okay until the storm comes, and then there's likely to be a grand collapse. So dependence, research indicates, is not the healthiest way to have relationships, nor is independence, where you're not connected at all to your significant other, but rather interdependence, where there's a mutual working together in life uh, and in growth. Now, the other part of the, you know, you complete me that can be really problematic is if I say to Susie, you complete me, that seems to indicate she better not change too much because if she does, she may stop completing me and then I may stop loving her, right? So there's a lot of pressure on her. Now, if at the same time I'm completing her, then I can't really be free to be myself and grow and learn either. So that can create some um, interesting and challenging relationship dynamics, let's put it that way. So rather than you complete me, we think a much better motto is you complement me. How can you help one another? And we... So let's <laughs> tell the story of, um, let's tell the story of our honeymoon. Uh, that ought to keep people uh, entertained okay, for a little while. Okay, which one? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, oh, okay. okay. May, maybe Good. not the one about our son Liam, who is backstage and was born nine months after the honeymoon. Maybe we should not get into that. Okay, so I'm married to a philosopher, and we go to the sunny beaches of St. Lucia. Has anyone been to St. Lucia? Uh, yeah, very beautiful. You don't need much there, right? Like your bathing suit, flip-flops, maybe sneakers if you run, dress. So, we're going to the airport, and James's bag was like way over the weight limit. I'm thinking, what on earth? Maybe he has scuba gear. No, I know he doesn't scuba dive. So, I was really curious. So we paid this hefty fee, and I just couldn't wait till we got to the hotel room. Well, for that too, but I really wanted to know what was in his suitcase. So, he opens up his suitcase, and I found dozens of, can anyone guess? Books. And I'm not talking about these paperback books, but hardback, probably first edition, um, the original Nick and McKeon Ethics, etched in stone. And I'm like, really? And I remember looking over at him going, okay, that's what I love about him. He loves to learn. But really, that many on our honeymoon? So fast forward an hour or two later, we're on the beach with the books, uh, having some cocktails, uh, at least I was, with those little you know, umbrella drinks, a couple of them, and we're talking about Aristotle, because that's what one talks about on their honeymoon, right? Sure. <laughs> Married to a philosopher. So seriously, we're talking about Aristotle, and we're talking about the Nick and McKeon ethics. I like to tease him. I really like Aristotle, too. Not as much as James, but we're talking about the good life. Who doesn't want to talk about the good life? And I'll let you take over here, since you're the philosopher. Okay. So I admit that when you think about St. Lucia or romantic relationships, the first thing that pops into your head probably is not Aristotle. But it turns out that Aristotle had some important things to say about relationships that have stood the test of time and are important insights for us today. So Aristotle says that human beings love three different kinds of things. He says we love what is useful, we love what is pe pleasurable, and we love what is good. And furthermore, he says, we have relationships, friendships that correspond to each one of these loves. So think about it, in your own life, I'm sure you had friendships of usefulness or utility where it's been mutually beneficial to be friends with each other. Maybe you've been on a sports team or maybe you've had a study buddy or maybe you've had a business partner and it's been really great for both of you to have that relationship because you've helped each other achieve things that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Aristotle says, furthermore, we have friendships of pleasure. 
And so again, hopefully you've had friends in your life that are just fun to hang out with. It's great to go out on the weekend. Think with of your them. college buds, right? You go That's out right. for a night on the town with. <laughs> That's right. And hopefully not just in college times, but also uh, later on as well. And Aristotle says there's nothing wrong with these two different types of friendship. But he says there's a third level of friendship that is even more important for human relationships. And that is relationships, friendships based on virtue. That's when you see the good in the other person. And that's what attracts you to that other person, their good character. And that goodness, that virtue, that character in the other person can even inspire you to want to be a better person yourself. So this is what we were talking about over drinks on the beach in St. Lucia. So we were talking about this notion of Aristotelian friendship. And I said, I think that's really beautiful. And why did Aristotle have to limit this just to platonic friends? Um, what if we took this up a notch and we applied it to our romantic relationship? So hopefully, you know, we have some pleasure going on here. We were definitely having pleasure on our honeymoon. And usefulness, we bring, you know, different skills to the relationship, like most people do. But what if we really focused on seeing the good in one another and trying to become better individuals and helping one another to become better together as a team. And James said, I love that idea. So we sort of made that like a marital mission statement on really seeing the good and trying to develop ourselves as individuals and as a team. So here are a couple more guests we've invited to help us make this point. You make me want to be a better man. That's maybe the best compliment of my life. <laughs> and what movie is this from? As Good As It Gets. Now, for those of you who've seen the movie, you know that Melvin um, has his difficulties. He's not a perfect <laughs> human being, to put it mildly. Uh, and he sees Carol, who's also not perfect. Um, but he sees Carol, and he sees the good in her. And he's so moved by that that it makes him want to be a better man. And you can see the effect that that has on Carol, noting that because of who she is, that's helping him to want to become a better person as well. So as I said earlier, instead of you complete me, we think this notion of you compliment me is much better. We know from positive psychology research, um, when you are inspired by someone uh, to do good, there's physiological changes going on in the body. Jonathan Haidt's work talks about this notion of inspiration or elevation or awe, right? So you're really um, inspired by, it could be beauty in nature or seeing goodness in action. And there's changes in the body. Your heart actually expands, and it leads to pro-social behavior. So while this is just movie examples, you know, the point we're trying to make, you know, in the beginning of the movie, not such a great character. By the end, his heart's opened, and he's like a bigot in the beginning of the movie, and at the end, he's more loving. But, I mean, in real life, when you look at people who are inspired, and they, not just feeling good, but doing good. So this notion of Aristotelian lovers helping each other to not just feel good, I mean, positive emotions are great, but really trying to do good. So doing good, action for happiness, action for relational happiness. This isn't just something for armchair philosophers. It's something for people who actually are willing to take action. And so we like to think of this as being in the relational gym, where it's not enough just to buy a membership, it's not enough just to go once and then you're fine, it requires habits of, uh, of exercise, where you go back to the gym over and over again to develop the skills and habits that can help you in your relational life. So here's another non-theoretical question for you. Um, how many of you would be up for actually doing some of the exercises uh, in the relationship gym together tonight? Okay, that's not a bad start. Let me reassure you, you will not pull a muscle on this. 
We will not require you to divulge anything you don't want to divulge. And if you want to talk about friendships or family relationships, that's totally fine too. Nobody's going to force you to talk about romantic relationships. So take two. How many of you would rather listen to Susie and me drone on and on about research? Or how many would like to actually engage in a, uh, a, a, a couple of exercises from the relationship gym together tonight? <laughs> oh my goodness, wow. You know, they told me that this audience could be a little difficult and I didn't believe them because I, I have spoken to surgeons in the United States um, and I thought that was, you know, a, a tough crowd. How about this? How about if we gently ease you into one of these exercises and if you don't like it, we'll skip the second one. Is that a good deal? <laughs> yeah? All right. I can see some skepticism lingering on some faces. But that's okay because I'm a philosopher and I like skepticism. So we're all, uh, we're all in good company. Okay. Here's the, all joking aside, here's the uh, exercise, I think. Uh, or it may not be here. Huh. I'm going to click it on. There we go. There we okay, go. so today's workout, the first exercise that we're going to invite you gently to do is to examine your relationships through the lens of Aristotelian love. So remember that Aristotle said that human beings love three different kinds of things. We love what is useful, relationships of utility. We love what is pleasurable, relationships of pleasure. And we love what is good, relationships of virtue. So in a moment... We're going to invite you, well, first of all, we're just going to invite you to think about this question just silently to yourself, and then to turn to a neighbor to share whatever you would be willing and interested to share about your relationships. You can choose one relationship or think about your relationships in general from an Aristotelian perspective. And again, you can choose to think about um, romantic relationships, or you can choose to think about friendships or family relationships or work relationships. The basic point here is to think about your relationships in the past, in the present, or in your aspirational future, the kinds of relationships you would like to have, and what can you learn about them when you view them through the lens of Aristotelian love, usefulness, pleasure, and goodness or virtue. So let's just take a moment to think about this quietly, and then I'll ask you to turn to your neighbor and share what you're willing to share. All right, let's take a moment to turn to your neighbor, and if you see somebody who doesn't have a neighbor, make them your neighbor. You can do three. That's, that's totally fine, too. So everybody has a partner. Great. Okay. I am so very sorry to interrupt you. You were having very interesting conversations by the sound, uh, by the sound of it. Uh, I'm curious if we just took a couple of minutes to hear from uh, a couple of you who would like to share what insights came out of your thinking about your relationships from an Aristotelian lens. Would anybody be willing to share a thought that came up from that? Yeah? Okay. And hang on one second. I think a microphone is coming your way, and then everyone, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we were. Ooh. <laughs> that is loud. Uh, we were talking about our relationship, and um, we're not a couple, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but we actually spoke about the word usefulness. In the actually, uh, we both felt a little bit uncomfortable with the mm. word purely because of the use, connotation of use. use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, so we actually use the word service. So we feel that mm. we, we sort of serve service, each other mm. and then yeah. serve other people. Mm. Um, and yeah, we have great fun together and we see the good in each other. Yeah. And, so, I, and, and with that, yeah, we inspire each other and we understand each other and being able to be understood by somebody yeah. is really important. Oh, fantastic. And then that allows yeah. you to be confident in yourself. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which then, yeah, it just makes yeah. a massive difference. So. No, I love that. Yeah. And so. The, and it the, works in love relationships as well, because I have it, and we both have it in our love relationship too. So it's really important. Yeah, and no doubt what you share in your friend relationship helps then in those other relationships yeah, that absolutely. you have as well, right? Yeah. I love that. Um, and yeah, the notion of usefulness or utility can ca have with it a kind of connotation like you're being used, used by somebody yeah, or exploited yeah. by somebody, yeah. and that's certainly not what we intend. So I like that reframing um, of service, uh, a reframing that both of you seem to agree to totally, strongly. Yeah. So it's yeah. just an indication of your uh, simpatico relationship. So well done. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, someone else want to share? So we make a lovely couple. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and the gentleman in the back, or th uh, two thirds of the way in the back. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I think I consider myself to have a, a good relationship with my father. So it's just interesting to note that I think the relationship with my father contains all those components. So he's useful to me. We do things for each other, you know, cook food and all that. Um, pleasure, like we can have a drink with each other, have a good time. We share jokes. We can have fun together. And um, he inspires me to be a better person. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. I hope you tell your dad that, your father that. Uh, as the father of a seven-year-old, um, I can feel even more the power of that. Um, you know, not, not all sons feel that way about their fathers, and so you're a fortunate, um, in a fortunate circumstance. Um, beautiful. Great. Maybe one more right here in the front. Um, hello. Good evening. So we spoke about how... For usefulness, you can have maybe 100 people and then mm. it'll go down to 50 for pleasure. And then for goodness, it suddenly goes down to maybe 10% of your whole social community um, of people. So I think that was quite important thing that we've raised. Also, um, we've raised the fact that you could be in a relationship with someone or have been in a relationship with someone but necessarily you won't see the goodness or they won't come and save you for, from a certain thing or would do something that a friend would do as well. And I think that's quite painful for people to realize that the more they get towards the goodness part, the less people they have. Mm. And I think it's something that mm. I guess we can learn from. Brilliant insights. You guys have definitely read the, Arist uh, the Nicomachean Ethics of Aristotle because that's precisely what he says. He says that um, real friendship, and again, there's nothing wrong um, in Aristotle's perspective with these other two forms of friendships. Uh, but he says that the third level is likely to last longer, right? So if you have a friendship of utility or usefulness, business partners, for example, the business stops, you're not likely to be friends beyond that. Or friendships of pleasure. It's not fun anymore, you graduate from college or whatever, and then you don't see each other anymore. But friendships of virtue, as long as the other person's virtue and your virtue continue to be good, your good character continues, then you're likely to want to be friends with each other. And he says that it requires an investment of time. And so you're not, you're not gonna have, you know, <laughs> how many friends do people have on Facebook these days? Like you're gonna, not gonna have friendships of virtue in the thousands. Um, it is gonna be a smaller number. That's a, that's a really great, great insight. Good, well thank you. Well I hope you continue um, this um, thinking about relationships from an Arist Aristotelian friendship. I think it can be useful to think about the degree to which we focus on helping each other, being mutually beneficial to each other, having uh, mutual uh, pleasure, and then also um, stimulating each other to, in to improve character. So we then, um, with this Aristotelian framing, uh, moved to the work of positive psychology. And I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Um, there we go. So um, the, yeah. I was just going to say Take the backdrop away, of the book is focusing on uh, seeing the virtue in one another and becoming better individuals and stronger as a team and doing good and putting good out in the world. And then we look to positive psychology research on what are some of those action-oriented things you can do, what habits. And we called through a lot of the research. And the four areas we found, these are by no way you know, the only areas or exclusive. These are ones that spoke to us that were uh, research-intensive and um, applied uh, very well to relationships. So the four we have listed here that we go into detail about, I don't have time to do that today, but briefly, um, the first area is promoting a healthy passion. 
as opposed to an obsessive passion. And this is work by uh, Bob Valerand, who is the former president of the International Positive Psychology Association and the Canadian Psychological Association. And he's dedicated pretty much his life work to the notion of passion and what is a healthy passion. And unfortunately, a lot of those examples we talked about in film and whatnot in pop culture, the way passion's often portrayed, not just with relationships, but it could be with exercise or sport, is this obsessive passion. And while people who are in an obsessively passionate relationship or uh, with an individual or let's say with a work or a workout routine may be just as successful as somebody who is in a healthy, um, has a healthy passion, uh, the one in obsessive uh, passion usually leads out to burnout because that's all they can think about. You know, um, it's only you on my mind all the time, or I could only think about, you know, this sport or activity. So we talk about how do you um, work towards more of a healthy passion, maintaining your own identity and also that friendship or romantic relationship. The second area we uh, dedicate a lot of uh, time and research to the importance of positive emotions. We know that they make us feel good, of course, but positive emotions are also good for us. In the beginning of a relationship, of course, uh, we experience an influx of a lot of high arousal positive emotions, not just those high arousal <laughs> physical positive emotions, but um, you know things like joy and gratitude and interest. And later on, sometimes in a relationship, they don't seem to be there as much. Um, well, the research shows that instead of waiting around for positive emotions to happen, if we could prioritize them into our life, just like you might prioritize you know, a sport or exercise or something you love to do. So thinking about what are those activities I enjoy doing maybe before my relationship and how can I plan them into my day? And then positive emotions will result from that. The next area we talk about is mindfully savoring. I think this is so important. We talk a lot about mindfulness as well. I think in our fast-paced culture, you know, throughout the world, we're just moving through things very quickly. And unfortunately, when it comes to relationships, um, a lot of people who we've talked to over the years and putting together the book, we found that it, we were a little surprised. It wasn't necessarily the big blow-ups that you know you hear about that led to the demise of a relationship. And sometimes, definitely, it is those things. But lots of the times, it was the small things, the things going unnoticed. So one couple who sadly broke up after I think 25 years or so, um, you know, she left her husband, and he was really surprised and had no idea why. And she said to us um, in many conversations, "I just." It wasn't really one thing, it was just a slow boil over the years. I just felt like he never even noticed me anymore. And it was really sad, and only after, you know, they broke up and he began dating other people, he said he realized how good he had it with her, but, you know, he took it for granted. So we talk a lot about the importance of savoring the moments rather than just waiting for the momentous. And then finally, uh, seeking out strengths in each other. So positive psychology is the study of strengths and what is going right in our lives and in our relationship. So we're going to talk a little bit more about strengths later. And that's just a brief overview, as Susie mentioned. There's much more uh, in the book uh, and on our website that we'll talk about in a moment if you want to go more deeply into it. For now, we want to focus specifically on one of the um, uh, parts of the book that we, that we develop specifically with regard to relationships, the interaction model. Because again, as Susie mentioned at the beginning, positive psychology and interventions often focus on the self and what the self can do, individuals can do for themselves or for others. Um, but in a relational situation, there's a duality, there's a dynamic nature that's important to keep in mind there. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been on the highway, and you have seen another driver do something unbelievably stupid, dangerous, or reckless. Let me see your hands. Oh, uh, you have those drivers over here too? Unbelievable. Oh, my word. What are they thinking? Okay, so how many of you have ever been on the highway, driving on the highway, and you yourself have done something unbelievably stupid, dangerous, or reckless? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. We are those drivers, aren't we? <laughs> So why is it that um, we, we have this experience on the highway, and then the next day we get on the highway again, and it's a whole new day, and we don't think about it? It's because at the end of the day, we have exited 
And when we come back on the next day, it's a whole new set of cars. Nobody remembers what happened yesterday on the highway. But what if it weren't a whole new set of cars? What if it were the same set of cars we drive with day in and day out? Yep, there's that yellow car that we almost drove off the road yesterday and that purple car that uh, almost drove off. What would, we would drive very differently if it was the same set of cars, right? And I think that that's a good metaphor for our relationships. We go through our lives surrounded closely by many of the same kinds of people, whether it's at work or in our families or in our romantic relationships. And so it's really important to understand the dynamic of that interaction, not just what we do, what we, um, uh, the actions that we take, but also how we respond to the actions that other people take as well. So we wanna apply this interaction model now and talk a little bit more about how it connects to strengths. Okay, I just wanna make one comment about the interaction model. Lots of times when we're talking to people, they say, well, what if my partner, my romantic partner, or my friend doesn't want to work on that? Then, you know, am I at a loss? And no, because as we know, if you look at a science experiment, as long as you're changing, you know, one side of it, you're going to have a different result. So it may take, you know, a little longer if somebody's unwilling, but we know when we start changing the way we act or react, the interaction changes. So there, there's always hope, even if, you know, your partner, if you're in a relationship and feeling stuck, um, by changing and doing something different, you could have a positive uh, result. So, um, who's familiar with the VIA classification of strengths? Okay, a lot of you are. Okay, so I'm just gonna say in brief, that's um, positive psychologists, um, you know, looked across time and cultures and found 24 strengths, as we know that we're all naturally, um, we have a lot of these strengths and in different configurations. Um, Things like creativity, love of learning, leadership, and it really fits, it's really like the backbone, I'd say. Uh, some people call it positive psychology, just the science of strengths. And these are really important to our well-being. We're going to go into strengths in a little bit more. And when James and I looked at these strengths, we noticed there was like a giving and a receiving side of the strengths. So some of the strengths in particular, like love, it's one thing to be able to love others. It's another thing to be able to receive the love of others, Right? We all know people who have no problem loving other people, but you try to express love to them and they can't really take it in, it seems. Or there are people who have no problem allowing themselves to be loved, but just don't ask for that love in return. Similarly, it's one thing to forgive someone else. It's another thing to um, allow someone else to forgive you. It's one thing to be kind to other people. It's another thing to allow people to be kind to you. It's one thing to be grateful to other people. It's another thing to accept gracefully the gratitude of others. So let's think about this final point uh, in a little bit more detail with the gift of gratitude. So Susie, I want to thank you. Um, A few years ago, I was um, beginning to wonder whether I was approaching middle age. And it turns out that my middle was answering that question for me as it expanded. And so I know that you have a background in nutrition, and so I asked you for some nutritional advice, and you gave it to me, and it was great. And so I followed that advice. You know, I ate a lot more salads. I laid off the carbs um, and exercised, and I noted that it made a difference in my life. And so I started to feel better. I started to look trimmer. People noticed that. They commented on that. That made me feel even better. And so it really helped me to um, be happier in my life. So thank you very much for that. Well, it wasn't really a big deal. It's, you know, just what I do. <laughs> what did you notice about that interaction of gratitude? It was, she couldn't receive it, right? It wasn't accepted. And what does that do to me? It devalues it. It's like I've got this gift, and it's like, eh, nah. So that's, a, that's kind of a powerful illustration of what can happen if the response doesn't continue what's going on. What did you notice about my offering or the way I expressed my gratitude? Did you notice anything about that? Specific. It was specific, absolutely. What else? It was all about me, (laughs) wasn't it? I, 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 and then I, 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 and that had the effect on me, 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 That's why I responded that way. (laughs) (laughs) So it's interesting. So we can respond in certain ways, 
we can also initiate in a variety of ways. So it's important to initiate gratitude. It's important to think about how we do so. This is why we like, and it's important to respond to gratitude, and it's important to think about how we do so, which is why we like to think of the dance of gratitude. If you have two people interacting, uh, to, to have the dance go well, both have to be playing their roles well. And it's been said of Ginger Rogers that she did everything that Fred Astaire did, only backwards in our, and in high heels. So our guess is that although expressing gratitude can be challenging sometimes, it might even be more challenging to receive and respond to the gratitude well. But first, a word about the initiation of gratitude. So uh, gratitude may be one of the most important strengths uh, for relationships. We can understand why, like in this example. Um, research shows, though, that expressing gratitude is important for both partners. In fact, in one study, there was 50% decrease of the couple breaking up if they felt that the gratitude was expressed well. Because you feel cared for and validated, unlike the couple I talked about earlier who you know, got separated, felt um, unloved and um, ignored. However, the important thing about gratitude, it's not just if you do it, it's how you do it. So the way James did it was more self-focused, how he expressed it to me. Um, when you express gratitude to express it well, the research shows by focusing on the other person. So, so for example, if I were to express gratitude for him, what are the skills and strengths of him what are his actions that he did rather than the benefit to me? So quick example, we were on a uh, holiday right before we came here and I was walking quickly and a bug flew into my eye. Normally I'm pretty high energy, I would kind of jump and swat it, I hate bugs. But instead, James um, <laughs> came up to me and said, okay, just be really calm and he's very rational thinking and he had me just be still and had me move my arm around certain ways and the bug came right out and I was very grateful. So I said to him in that moment, I really appreciate your calmness, you got that bug out of my eye. I mean, it sounds funny, but I'm really afraid of bugs. But so focusing on uh, what he did and his calmness and his... Um, and that was really great for me yeah. because this is this, neither one of us expected this to happen. It just so <laughs> happened that I could be there and I figured out how to help and get the bug out. And then the, what she said to me, it really, it made me feel good. It made me feel appreciated. This is not to say that you never <laughs> should talk about the benefits um, of being in a romantic or other kinds of relationships. But if that's all you talk about, then the other person might start to wonder, you know, am I being exploited or used in some way? Or is there something deeper in this relationship? So let's talk about the response side of this. Now, interestingly, there's a lot more research on the initiation of gratitude than there is on the response of gratitude. Um, and so as we've thought about different ways of responding to gratitude, um, one of them is this kind of deflection. So that's what Susie demonstrated earlier. It's just kind of a not accepting something. Here's another one. Susie, I really like your dress. Oh, I like your shoes. <laughs> so I paid her a compliment, and she paid it right back because we don't like to be in each other's debt. We don't like to feel like I haven't evened things up in some way, which is good. I mean, you don't want somebody who never gives compliments and always is only receiving them. But part of what's nice about a relationship is feeling like you don't have to even it up right away, right? You know what? I'll, I'll get dinner tonight. And your friend isn't reaching for their wallet to even things up. You know right. that, you know, the next time around, they'll take care of it. Well, you're not really letting it land. We like to right. joke and say it's like the game of hot potato you might have played as a kid. You know, you're throwing the ball back and forth. It's like you don't want to get burned by it. And people are afraid to, like, receive the gratitude. And it's interesting because when we were looking into this and talking to a lot of researchers, it's like George Valiant, it was this sense of vulnerability. A lot of people can't receive it because... It, it opens you up, right? Which is a beautiful thing. It's also a scary thing. So if James is paying me a compliment, but I can't, you know, receive it well, it's, it's often, you know, a challenge with vulnerability. So, Susie, speaking of vulnerability and potatoes, uh -oh. um, <laughs> can we talk about the dinner, uh, the dinner example? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me give a preface, though. So I'm half Italian. My family loves food. I grew up with a really great um, uh, cook as a mom. And she always taught me the importance of food, not that James didn't grow up valuing food, but I just want to say this. So when I cook something, I like it to go well. <laughs> okay, now you can tell this story. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah, right. you just had to know that. <laughs> All right. So early in our marriage, I came home and Susie had prepared dinner. 
I ate the dinner. At the end of the dinner, I said, Susie, thank you so much for making the dinner. I really appreciate your efforts. It was delicious. It was great. Thank you for doing that. And Susie said, Oh, man, you wouldn't believe it. I ran out of the spice that I really needed, so then I had to replace it with a different one, and it wasn't as good. Then the phone rang, and I overcooked the potatoes. And then the rice that I wanted to get, they didn't have that brand at the store, so I bought a different one, and it was drier. <laughs> True story. So at this point, I'm thinking, what in the world? Like, I just wanted to express gratitude for She got, she got like annoyed dinner. with me, and I'm like, what? I'm just telling you everything wrong with the meal. It wasn't that good. So I'm making a note to myself. It wasn't a good evening. <laughs> I'm making a note to myself, never compliment Susie again on the dinner. <laughs> It makes her feel bad. It makes me feel bad. It makes me realize the dinner was pretty crappy after all. I hadn't, re <laughs> hadn't realized it to that point. But the point here is, is a serious one. And this goes far beyond the kitchen or the dining room, right? And I think it happens to, it, it tends to happen in areas of expertise or mastery. Think about it in your own life and something that you're really good at. And let's say that you, you do something that you think is about a B. It's not an A, it's about a B. And somebody comes up to you and compliments you and says, that was phenomenal. You did a great job on that. The tendency is to do what? Oh, if you only knew what I'm capable of. <laughs> if you only knew what it should have been, right? And what does that do to the person who's offering the compliment or the gratitude? They, they don't know, but now they realize, oh, they shouldn't have been happy about this. They shouldn't have been moved by it because it was really pretty crappy after all, right? So this kind of discounting is a way of disrupting the dance of gratitude uh, as well. So in contrast to that, we suggest that it's hard to beat acceptance. Just a genuine thank you while looking someone in the eye is often a great way to um, accept the gratitude and to continue that dance of gratitude. Now, going beyond that, there may be cases where amplification of it, savoring it can be really important. Because if I'm offering a compliment or gratitude to Susie, I want her to take it in. And when she takes it in, that makes me feel good. So if she can take it in and then communicate to me how that makes her feel that she's taking it in, that can be really great. And then finally, in some contexts, it can be really interesting to advance the relationship based on the insights that you can discover by thinking about, by observing what the other person is grateful for. I mean, look, frankly, in my relationship with Susie, I do so many wonderful things. <laughs> you know, I mean, she could thank me for any number of them. <laughs> and, you know, she just doesn't see most of them, it seems, sometimes, <laughs> right? That's a, well, um, that sometimes feels like it is the case. Sometimes that feels like that is the case in relationships that have been together for a long time, right? Because it's not novel anymore. And so I just do it. What's interesting, though, is when Susie does notice something, and, and I mean, she notices a lot more than she expresses, but when she singles something in particular out to say, James, that was re I really appreciated that, there's something really interesting to be learned from that, isn't there? Why would she single that out? And so, again, if the context is right, I might say, Susie, thank you so much. I really appreciate you noting that. That makes me feel really good. And I'm curious, what's something, why is it, what is it about that that really resonates with you? And that, that gives her an opening, should she choose to, to explain to me why my calmness and rationality at a time when I could have been flipping out and so forth is really important to her, not just if she's got a bug in her eye, but if she's concerned about other things happening in life and she's uncertain about the future or about you know, any number of things that can arise in life. And that can teach me a lot about her and it can help me to advance, help us to advance the relationship as well. All from something that I very easily could have deflected or reciprocated or discounted, right? I just want to briefly say, too, of course, you know, take the context in. If you start doing this at a cocktail party, people will think you're kind of nuts. You know, what did you mean <laughs> right. by that compliment? You know, they might, like, flee. And also, there's, of course, personality, gender differences, cultural differences. My dad, if I was to, you know, thank him in a very uh, public way, would not like that. Like, he's more of a very private person. So some people, like, writing letters or, you know, nonverbal communication, you really have to know your friend or your partner and you know, work with him or her. We're not saying, you know, these are the things you do every time, so. Yeah, no, those are really important points, uh, Susie. 
So do you want to say, I mean, this isn't just an issue that, um, by the way, how many of you would say that responding to gratitude or responding to a compliment can sometimes feel awkward to you? Let me see your hand. Okay, so it's not just you and yeah, me. Yes. Yeah, uh, and it's not just us. Yeah. So um, it was funny, as we were um, talking about um, a lot of this work, um, uh, New York Magazine wrote a big article about the different ways to respond to gratitude that we just spoke about, um, that we detail um, in our book. And then the Today Show picked up on it, and it was cracking up. A friend called me, and I, I don't usually watch it, to turn on the TV, they're talking all about your deflection. And it was really funny seeing the host, because everyone had like a different sort of, a, a similar experience, but different ways, like where some person was like a deflector, like I said in the beginning, no big deal. Another was like a reciprocator. So we realized that this sense of receiving compliments and receiving them well, it, um, a lot of people seem to have a challenge with it. And I mentioned a little earlier that vulnerability seemed to be a key. And it's really interesting because, again, like, sometimes it's the things we don't do, like, in relationships, like the act of omission of not working out, you know, not being open and being closed. Then the things we do do, we, we see if you're doing something horrendous and you're fighting with your partner. But lots of times, I think, with our hearts being closed and um, not allowing, you know, our partner to really connect with us, sometimes that can be, um, you know, problematic. Great. So let's take this from theory to practice. Um, and what we'd like to do is to invite you to practice the gratitude dance. So I hope you brought your um, dancing shoes. I'd no, like all of you to stand up. No, I'm not going to do that. No, <laughs> this is not that kind of a uh, gratitude dance. But I would like to invite you to practice the gratitude dance. Before that, though, I just want to go over again the two parts of it. So initiating gratitude. Remember, it's important to be grateful, to notice and cultivate uh, reasons why you're grateful to your friend or family member or romantic partner. And then it's important to express that gratitude. Sometimes we think it's just enough for us to feel it, but most partners aren't mind readers. And so it's important to express that gratitude. And as Susie mentioned, it's important to express that gratitude in an other focused way uh, as well. And then with regard to responding to gratitude, being open to the expressed gratitude of the other, accepting the gratitude, savoring that gratitude, receiving it deeply and amplifying it, and then finally, when it's appropriate, identifying areas of shared value by advancing, by asking questions about it. So here is our uh, invitation to you. So think of a recent time you expressed gratitude. It could be for a friend, a colleague, a romantic partner. Just think of somebody in mind. And did you focus on that other person? on their actions, their unique personality traits or strengths, or did you focus on yourself and the benefit? And if you did focus on yourself, how could you reframe that expression? Great. And then secondly, how do you typically respond to gratitude? Is it through by deflection, reciprocation, and discounting, or do you accept, amplify, and advance? How might you modify your responses to gratitude to be a better dance partner? And what we're going to invite you to do is maybe find somebody to pair up with that you didn't work with last time, so you can kind of um, meet somebody new. And just take a couple of minutes to think about these two areas in terms of initiation of gratitude and response to gratitude. Right. <laughs> Very good. Oh, man, I'm really curious to see uh, what you have been talking about. So let's maybe just hear from a couple of you who would like to share your insights um, from, the, uh, from the experience. Yes, ma'am. We'll get a microphone here in just a moment. Wow. Speedy <laughs> volunteer. Let's have a hand for our volunteer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So we were just having a conversation and I was uh, making the link between feeling a lack of entitlement and the debt concept. And I was saying to the person I was speaking to that when any, anyone like a stranger is really kind to me, I then have to feel the need to buy them a gift as a way of cancelling out the debt. Yeah. Um, and also I was like, this whole gratitude thing and receiving compliments and I thought if somebody says to me, I like your bag, then I'll say thank you. And then if somebody says, oh, I really appreciate what you did for me, I'll be like, great, that's, I, I'll, I'll take that compliment. But if someone says, oh, I really like this quality about you, 
then I start to feel, let's change the subject. So, <laughs> so that, that was just a little reflection that yeah. I had. Yeah, interesting, interesting observations. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I learned from a mentor of mine um, named John, John Locks, um, who I, to whom I owe so, so much in my life. And as I was getting to know him and I was receiving so much from him, I said to him, John, I don't just want to be a taker. Like, how can I give back to you? And he said something to me very profound. He said, give back to the community. Give back to the community. So I think that's something that we can do with that impulse to be grateful, pay it forward, move it forward, give back to the community. And then it's not just a reciprocation. It's not a hot potato kind of thing. I'm paying you back. But it's I'm paying it forward. I'm, I'm extending the goodness and helping it to move, uh, move forward in the world. Great. Thank you for those observations. Really insightful. Maybe one other person. Yes, in the back. I was um, talking about being very happy to receive compliments and um, accepting them, feeling, feeling that they help, help me flourish. But I also felt that sometimes if I receive compliments where someone is so grateful for something I've helped them with, that has been so easy for me to do mm. and facilitate, that sometimes... It's not a deflection, but someone might say, oh, you've done so much for me. It's actually, well, actually, most of it you did yourself. And it's not meant as a deflection, but sometimes as a rebalancing, I feel, especially I work as a trainer and a facilitator, that people can be overly grateful, not because they don't mean it, but they haven't really realized that they've done the journey mostly themselves. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting what you were just saying about talking about the community, but I think that sometimes people need to be appreciated for what they've done, mm -hmm. And even though they're saying thank you, there's something about how you reciprocate in that conversation. So. Yeah, look, I think that's a really insightful comment. Um, and it really raises the point that this is not a one-size-fits-all. It's not a formula. Uh, and so there may be contexts where the person is not, is kind of projecting onto you things, strengths that they themselves have. And in that context, for you to help kind of reflect back to them actually take a look at what actually happened here. Look, I did, I, I catalyzed one small part of this, but look what you did. That could be uh, the, the way of supporting the good in the other in an Aristotelian sense in that context. So absolutely, it's a, it's a nuanced kind of thing. I mean, it's tough enough when it's just one person, but when you get two people or more involved in these kinds of interactions, um, they, can be, uh, they can be challenging, but I think you have a, a very good point. Great, well, thank you so much for this feedback. Um, you did a great job with the workouts, um, so I, I really appreciate, uh, appreciate that. We've got one more exercise for you, which we will leave to you as a homework, should you choose um, to accept it. And it has to do now going back to character strengths. So we talked a little bit about character strengths earlier, and we know that practicing using our strengths in new and different ways um, is associated with greater well-being. And more recent research we know about character strengths, when we help our partner use his or her strength, it might be like a dormant strength of creativity, but really helping him or her express it, it leads to a greater relational and greater sexual satisfaction. And everybody's waking up, they're like, oh, okay, sexual satisfaction here. So how can we help our partner you know, become better and look to his or her strengths, not strengths that we put on them? Okay, so next we wanna talk about strength states. First, I want to ask, how many of you have ever been on a date, a date that you kind of were dragged on begrudgingly to do something that you didn't want to do, but you did it because you know your partner wanted to do it? Okay, some of us. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, that, you know, we often do it for a partner. Like, I, I spend Saturday evenings most weekends at the library. No, I'm just kidding <laughs> with James. But... Um, Seriously, a lot of us do that, and it's nice, of course, to compromise and do what our partner wants to do, but what if we could go on dates where we both really felt joyous and intrinsically motivated, right? So we like to talk about the notion of a strength state. Has anybody been on a strength state? Okay, like one or two people, good. Okay, so in a strength state, you choose one of your top strengths, and I didn't say earlier, but you could find out, for those of you not familiar with the VIA, the 24 character strengths that uh, positive psychology 
psychologists looked to cultures um, across time and found that they're ubiquitous pretty much. Like I said, creativity, love, love of learning. We all have strengths. We have them in different configurations. You could take a free test, about 10 minutes, the VIA Strength Survey. We have a link to it on our website, which is buildhappytogether.com. We put the build in there because I like to say it takes work, buildhappytogether.com. Anyhow, when you find out your top strengths, you could choose one of them. So let's say in our example, personal real life example, I might choose um, zest is pretty high up there for me. And James, let's say love of learning. And then what is an activity or an outing the two of us can do together where we could use um, these two strengths that we just named? So a recent example we did, um, we rented segways. Um, we live in the historical area of Philadelphia. Um, in Pennsylvania, that's me up front <laughs> doing my zest full uh, segueing, and we did a tour around um, the old old city. This is Pennsylvania Hospital. We had a really great tour guide, and we learned a lot of interesting facts that we never knew about it. And at the end of the day, uh, my sense of adventure was satisfied, and James's love of learning. I'll say peaked, because he really loves to learn, but he was happy. And it's interesting because, as I said, when you use your strengths, it's intrinsically motivated, and using your strengths in novel ways leads to greater satisfaction. So doing dates like this um, that are intrinsically motivated rather than in extrinsically, um, you could have a much better time. So our invitation to you is to plan your own strength state. This can be romantic with your romantic partner. It can be just an afternoon or a morning with a friend or a family member or a colleague uh, at work. So it's uh, very versatile in whatever direction you'd like to take it. It's an assignment that we gave to Larry King and his wife, <laughs> Sean, when they interviewed us a few months ago. Uh, and so we're looking forward to hearing back uh, what their experience has been like. We're in, look, looking forward to hearing back what your experience has been like. So if you'd care to share it with us on the website, Susie mentioned buildhappytogether.com. We'd love to, uh, love to hear about that. So we talked about at the beginning of this evening about how important it is not just to think about relationships. That is important, and it's important to have conversations about these things. It's also important to take action about them. And it's uh, important to do what we like to think of as going into the relationship gym. Now, with all gyms, you have the opportunity of going in by yourself, and that can be rewarding and important. But it's also really nice, isn't it, to go in and take classes at the gym and exercise with other people. And so a huge motivator for Susie and me to write this book and to do this work together, first of all, we wanted to have a project that we could use to work on our own relationship, because like anybody else, we need work on our relationship as well. And we also thought of it as a way of inviting others into the relationship, Jim, so we could have workout buddies and partners beyond just ourselves, but people who maybe have experiences um, that we haven't had, or maybe we could share some ideas and some uh, tips that we've discovered along the way, to have a community of people thinking together, speaking together, working together, taking action together to support each other in the development of these relationships. So thank you so much for joining us in the relationship gym this evening and for working out gamely uh, with us um, over the course of the last uh, hour or so. Again, the book uh, that we've written together, Happy Together, Using the Science of Positive Psychology to Build Love That Lasts, has plenty more exercises for those of you who would like to do more. Um, the website buildhappytogether.com has a lot more resources if you'd like to follow up with this on your own life, in your own life. Whatever you choose, we wish you all the best in your own journey toward developing positive character and well-being and towards doing so in a relational context uh, in, that gives so much meaning to our lives. So. And I, I just wanted to say working on relationships one at a time and sharing best practices. I mean, we really believe that, you know, creating healthy relationships, whatever, whatever kind of relationship, romantic and otherwise, can really make a positive difference in the world. And I feel like we talk about problems in relationships a lot. And we talk about other areas of our life, but I don't hear so much good practices in relationships. What if we made a practice to share those things and really build healthy relationships? And Hopefully we can make an impact, you know, on the world in a collective uh, way together. So let's do it. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.